Good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning, dear friends. Good to be back here with you yet again on this beautiful Sunday morning on the Lord's Day. Uh, last week, if you recall, we were in uh, Joshua, the first chapter, Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 to 9. And we were looking at, at that passage, and, and in three times in nine verses, God tells us in his word to be strong and courageous. He tells Joshua that. He's encouraging Joshua as he leads the nation of Israel into the promised land after the 40 years of wandering. That strength, that courage is found in our relationship with the Lord. Clearly, as we see that, we saw that in the passage that we looked at last week. Today we're going to jump ahead into the New Testament as Dave read from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to see how that, that strength, that courage is manifested, finds its perfect revelation, as it were, in the grace of Jesus Christ. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. The foundation of our lives, the foundation of our faith, this very source of strength and courage is the grace of Jesus Christ. It's so beautiful. Do not take it for granted. Do not neglect it. Do not forget about it. Sometimes we, we tend to do that or we can if we're not vigilant about that. That's what we're going to look at today. Remember in, in Nehemiah chapter 8, Nehemiah says that the joy of the Lord is my Strength. So if Nehemiah is telling us that the joy of the Lord leads to strength, that joy finds itself in the grace of Jesus Christ. That should, that should make you filled with joy, and contentment, and peace. You know, on a, it was an overcast day in Florida. It was in the winter of 2013, about six, six years ago. There was a man whose family had lived in this same house for generations generation suddenly lost his life when a, a sinkhole opened up beneath the home's foundation. Kind of like the picture you're seeing on the screen right now. Beneath the home's foundation, causing, causing the floor to collapse and simply swallow up the house. And this man was in one of the bedrooms at the time, in this story I'm sharing with you. You know, experts say that there are parts of Florida where the limestone that lies beneath the earth's surface, the earth's surface, so you can't see it, it's not visible to the, to the naked eye, That's, uh, that limestone is being eroded, dissolved slowly by the uh, rainfall. You see, when enough of that foundation, when enough of the bedrock is eaten away, it causes a void. A deficiency, as it were, and the fault of the structure just simply collapses under its own weight, under the weight of an inadequate foundation which can no longer support the structure, much like the picture you see here. So when you think about that, you think about the importance of a, of a strong foundation when you're building something, a, a structure, a, a building, a, a, an organization perhaps, a, uh, how about a family? Uh, how about your own life? How about your church? It starts with a foundation. And the foundation is instrumental. It's of first importance. The foundation is where we start. It's the beginning. It's the firm ground, the rock on which the rest of the organization, structure, family, church stands. It's this unwavering, immovable rock of the grace of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. It's crucial, crucial that we get that right. And it's also crucial that we maintain the integrity of that foundation. In today's passage, we're going to see the Apostle Paul. I love this passage, by the way. He's, Paul is writing this letter to the church at Corinth. Now, now let me stop for a minute here. When I say to you the word church, what's the first thing that comes into your mind? What's the first picture that comes into your mind? Maybe it's a place where you go. Maybe it's this place or some other place. It's that place, you know, where the building and the steeple and so on, that's, 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 that's what church is. And that's not wrong, but that's not literally what the word means. In the Greek, the Greek word for church is ecclesia. You know what that word means? It means those who have been set apart. 
those who have been called out. In other words, you and me, we are the church. It's not a physical structure so much as it is, as it is our hearts redeemed by the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, it is a place where we gather, for sure. And we invite our friends and neighbors and co-workers, especially those who, who, who don't know nothing of the grace of Jesus Christ, to come and share in that incredible offer of grace. To be sure. Here, Paul writes to this church, this group of people in Corinth who, by the grace of Jesus Christ, have come to faith and salvation. And are gathering as a group of people in Corinth. Corinth, where is Corinth? Corinth was a, a major city in Greece. Paul is writing this, he is writing it in, in Ephesus right now, and he's on the, uh, he, he's on the east side of the Aegean Sea, and, and, and Corinth is on the west side of the Aegean Sea. So there's a lot of distance that separates the two. This place, Corinth, is also the place where the temple of the sex goddess Aphrodite existed. It's important to remember because it's a place of diversity, diversity in commerce, uh, diversity in ideas, and, and, and a diversity in all kinds of practice. And this church was established during Paul's second missionary journey. And as we read in his letters to this church, it was a very gifted church. Incredibly so. You know, almost so much so that it caused somewhat of, a, somewhat of a schism within the church because they were comparing each other's gifts, spiritual gifts as it were, one with the other. And, and I want Larry's gift, and, 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 and Norm wants Jimmy's gift, and, and so on and so forth. And a lot of that still exists today, doesn't it? This church, as I said, was established in Paul's second, second missionary journey. It was a gifted church. It's also experienced... Many conflicts. Conflicts do, you know what, do primarily to this jealousy, this strife. And strife is a bitter disagreement. Strife is not just like we can't, we can agree to disagree and still be brothers and sisters, but this strife was a bitter disagreement that started to divide them. In particular, in the first three chapters, Paul addresses one thing in particular that was causing these divisions. You know what they were doing? They were comparing as a church, as a group of people whom they followed. Some said, I follow Paul. Others said, well, I follow Apollos. Yet others in chapter 1 said they followed Cephas, Peter. Some followed Christ. Paul is basically saying to them and to us, what are you doing? We are just men, sinful men, as it were. You follow Jesus Christ. Who's the foundation? Because he's full of grace. So Paul writes this, his first of two known letters to this church. And he does it to, to recalibrate. I love that word. You know, think of a compass, right? If you've ever used a compass, if you've been out in the woods, the whole purpose of the compass is the compass points to true north. Shows you and I where we are in relation to true north. Paul does the same thing. He shows where we are. We've gone off track, right? How did I end up here? How did I, I don't know how I ended up here. I was over there, but I ended up here. Paul is using this letter to recalibrate us back to the foundation of the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's doing this to challenge them and us about this beautiful, incredible, gracious love that we have in the gospel, full of grace and full of truth. Remember, as Paul is going to remind them and us of five things particularly, that Jesus He's our model. That making disciples of Jesus, it's our mission. That love, the love of God, and the love of God's word, and the love of people, that is our motive. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is our means. And this foundation, this gospel of grace, Jesus Christ, his beautiful word, is our message. It's all laid out for us. We walk the path 
That's what discipleship is. As we grow in our love and affection for God, His Word, and for people. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, thank you as we dive into this incredible passage that the grace of Jesus Christ has, is, and will change everything. And one day, Lord, one day, one day, it'll all be restored to its perfect and wonderful creation and grandeur, Lord. Between now and then, ours is to be instruments in the hand of the Redeemer to spread that sweet aroma, the fragrance of the gospel of grace. So help us today, Lord. Help us as we look into this passage, Lord, to see us, to challenge us in, a, in that gracious way to, 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 to maybe not take this for granted. Maybe some of us have. I know I have an occasion. Or to neglect the beautiful grace of Jesus Christ. So open our hearts and our minds to hear from you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, without further ado, let's dive right in. Paul says in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, But I, brothers and sisters, but I, brothers, could not address you, he says, as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. Paul is making the distinction here. In the, at the end of chapter 2, he says that there are some people who are natural people, natural people, people of the flesh, and as spiritual people. In fact, he says at the end of chapter 2, we have the very mind of Christ. In other words, we have the very words of Christ. We have the attitude of Christ. We know we've been blessed with the revelation, the special revelation of God's word, Paul says. And those who are spiritual, who have the Holy Spirit indwelling in them by the grace of Jesus Christ, they're being led by that spirit. He's reminding them of that and us. But he's addressing this, this, this strife that has occurred in them. And he says, you know, I, I couldn't address you. I couldn't consider you a spiritual people. Now, they have come to faith in Christ. They are the church in Corinth. He's not calling into question their salvation. No, he's not. What he's calling into question is their sanctification. They've set aside the most important thing and the things that, that will continue to sanctify them because now all of a sudden they're, they're all about these, these, these comparisons as we're about to see. And he makes the distinction, he says, I could not address you to consider you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. Now last I checked, everybody in this room, myself included, we have flesh. Flesh and bones. So what is Paul saying here? What is he referring to? Flesh is a metaphor. Flesh is a way of describing uh, the way the world works. The world that we live in. Flesh is, is, that, is, 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 is the way that we, we can focus on our thoughts and on our desires to fulfill them. It becomes about those desires. You know, whatever, whatever makes you feel good or whatever is good, just go ahead and do it. Live for today and the consequences we'll deal with later. Faith in Jesus Christ and being led by the Holy Spirit enables us to live with our minds our thoughts set on the truth of God's Word. His discernment, His wisdom, His Holy Spirit living inside of us. Think of it this way, that our thinking is no longer stuck in the grooves, in the grooves of a fallen world. You know, this week we had that ice storm and you guys experienced it here too. We were in Markham, you know, and, and, and the, the, the crews didn't get out there enough in, in time enough, and then the ice formed. But there was that track bear, you know, the, as you drive on the road, there, was, there were sections where if you stayed on that groove, you were, you were okay. But the minute you swayed off of that, you got in trouble. Think of, think of the flesh as being in the groove of the world. No, 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 we don't want to stay there. We want to focus our attentions on the grace of Jesus Christ. So Paul says of them, I could not even consider that, but as infants in Christ, so they were babes in Christ, they had come to faith in Christ, but they hadn't matured yet. They're still not maturing yet. Look what he says in verse 2. He says, I fed you with milk, not solid food. You weren't ready for it. Uh, even now, you're not ready for it. Even now, you're not ready for it. As, it's a metaphor, right? He's talking about as you, as you come to faith in Christ, you, you, you repent of your sins by, 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 by faith alone, by grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone. Hallelujah. Praise God. You come to faith in Christ, but you don't 
stay there. You don't just are satisfied with that, that, that initial conversion, as it were. It's, it's not just about conversion, it's about transformation. Your thinking, your lives, everything conformed to the image of Christ. So Paul says, you know, as an infant, you were, you, I fed you with milk. The foundational things, the, 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 the primary things, as it were. Okay? But by now, he says, you should be growing up. You're still of the flesh, he says, verse 3. You weren't ready for solid things. You, you, you were satisfied with milk, and there's nothing wrong with milk, by the way. Even as a child grows into maturity, an infant becomes a child and then becomes an adult, and uh, nothing wrong with milk. You can drink milk on, until your dying days. There's nothing wrong with that. But here's the point. You should not be just satisfied with milk. As you grow older, as you mature, as you, get lar as you, as you, as you grow into, into adulthood, mil milk just doesn't cut it anymore. But that doesn't mean you leave milk aside, but by now you should, your desire should be for more. Don't be just satisfied with the milk. That's what he's saying here. At this point, your passions and affections should be for the deeper things of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're still not. He says, you're still of the flesh. Verse 3, even while there's jet, look, here's, and he's going to be very specific now. Look at this. This is why he says this. He says, there's jealousy and strife among you. Are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? Jealousy, this constant comparison, as I, as I alluded to, between, you know, me and you, you and me, him, there, whatever it might be. You know, if you insist on comparison, if you insist on being on, on the person who wants to compare, let me encourage you with this. If you want to, compare yourself with yourself. That's not a bad thing. How am I in comparison to where I was in my walk with the Lord um, a week ago? Uh, a month ago? A year ago? That is a good thing. Those are good comparisons. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of the story, and I was, when we were uh, living in Alberta, Elizabeth and our daughter Emily and I was pastoring, there was a man, a wonderful man, and he, was, he, he still is a very dear friend of mine, of ours. And he, uh, I remember one of the initial meetings we had, and he shared the story with me, and he said, you know, Pastor Eddie, he said, I've been walking with the Lord for, I think it was something like 45 years, or something like that. He said, wow, praise God. But you know what, over the course of time, it became evident that this man, godly man, wonderful man, filled with grace and truth, you know what happened to him? He had the one-year experience repeated 45 times. There's very little depth. You scratched the surface and there was not a whole lot there. In many instances, he neglected the grace of Jesus Christ. And what he did, and this is true of all of us, if we're not careful, we will default naturally to works. That's what you will become if you don't check your hearts. How do I know that? Guilty. When I let myself go. Be careful. Be very careful. Paul says, you, there was jealousy and strife among you. You're not, aren't you behaving of the flesh? And, only, and he says here, look at this, this is beautiful. Here's another expression of grace. He says, you're behaving only in a human way. You know what he's acknowledging? to them and to us, that you will. It's inevitable. You're going to behave in a human way. You know why? Because you're human. He's reminding them, don't behave only in a human way. You will. You, your tendency will be to do that. But he said, but he's challenging them and us, but be careful that that's not the only thing that you're about. You're behaving only in a human way. He says, look what he says, verse 4. He says, for, and here's a specific example that, that, that he's addressing in this chapter. One says, quote, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Aren't you being merely, only, human? He's reminding them and us of the importance. The importance to hitch our wagons, to use that metaphor, to Jesus Christ. Not to Paul, Apollos, him. You know that, that, that this kind of stuff still goes on today? 
I, I've been a pastor for many years all over this country, man. If I've seen it once, I've seen it, I don't know, dozens of times, especially the guys, men, this is true, the young guys in particular, they'll come up to me, you know, full of vim and vigor. Pastor Ed, he says, you know, you know, I, are, you, are you a such and such a guy? They'll quote somebody that we know, you know, pastors or friends. I follow that guy. Are you, are you that guy? No. I want to be a Jesus Christ guy. I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And you know what happens oftentimes? And, and you know, on that, and I don't want to downcast that or downplay that or in any way cast aspersions. You know, I was that myself, to be honest, when I first came to the Lord. But here's the point I find with that. That I'm about this guy or I hitch my wagon to this pastor, this preacher, this group of people, so on. That's more because I'm not this. And, and I don't want to be this. Whatever this is, that pastor, this group, these people. So as a result of not being that, man, I'm going to be all about this. It's more about what I'm not rather than what I am. And this is what I say to those young men. This is what I say to myself and to all of us. Be about who you are, not who you're not. Be about those things. Paul challenges them, the Apostle Paul. Some are saying these things. Aren't you being just merely human? Aren't you only behaving in that way? He talks about that flesh and how acting in the flesh creates factions. And now he's moving his metaphor from verses 5 to 9 to something like he uses this metaphor of a field. He's going into this agricultural metaphor. Remember, the field is a place where you plant Right? We, we, you plant seeds that produce fruit. Look what he goes on to say, verse 5. He says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul speaking? Now he's speaking in like the second or third person. He's talking about himself. What is Apollos? What is Paul? And then look, look at the description in one word. You know what he says of himself and, and, and Apollos? Servants. That's it. One word. That's all we are. Paul says that. Himself, referring to himself, to Apollos, to you, to me. That's all we are, your servants. No greater honor, no greater honor to be bestowed upon anyone in Christ than to be called a disciple of Jesus Christ, a servant of the Almighty God. That's it. On your gravestone, that's what I hope is said on mine. There's Ed, who was a disciple of Jesus Christ. Thank you. That's all I want. A servant of the Almighty God. Amen. That's what he's saying here. That's what he's talking. He's talking about himself and he's talking about Paulus. Now, who is Apollos? Well, we know this. Apollos was an evangelist. He was an uh, apologist. Now, what is that? That's not somebody who's going around apologizing. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. An apologist is somebody who makes a defense in favor of. It's a gift. I know some men and women like that. What a gift. Apollos was that. He was a church leader. Apollos, we know, was a Jew, Jewish heritage from Alexandria in Egypt. Paul, Jerusalem in Israel. They didn't know each other until, you know what happened? To the grace of Jesus Christ changed their lives. Now they're friends or oh, more than friends, they're co-workers, co-laborers. Oh, wait a minute, excuse me, Paul, I'll, let's, let's use your description, servants. That's how Paul describes himself in a Paul. He goes, that's what we are. He says, we, we're just servants through whom, now I love this part, this reminder is not only for them, for himself, I should say, it's for them. We're servants through whom you, church at Corinth in this case, believed as the Lord assigned to each an assignment is here the assignment that the Lord assigned to Paul and to Apollos was to be instruments of grace in God's hand in this case at Corinth and they, pro they, they, they proclaim the gospel of grace these people their assignment as divinely ordained by God, was what? That their minds and their hearts were regenerated and they came to faith in Jesus Christ. Hitch your wagons to the gospel of grace. 
Paul's reminding them of that. It was my assignment to be used of God as a servant, to bring you this message. You're, you were assigned the incredible gift to believe. He's reminding them. Look what he says in verse 6. He says, I, talking about himself, I planted. It's a metaphor. Apollos watered. But look what the end of verse 6. But who gave the growth? God gave the growth. Past tense. Remember? Paul, remember? Remember what God did? God did that. God gave the growth. I planted, you know, if there's any gardeners in, in, in the room, soon, soon, bear with me, soon, spring is not that far away, and you'll be able to get out in your gardens. You know, Paul is saying he planted, you know, you get the hoe and you, you dig the hard ground, you do that. Paul said that was his task. That's what he did as a metaphor. And he, he says, and, and what did Apollos do? Paul, he did that. He planted the seed. Paulus came by later watered, nurtured, beautiful, nurtured. But, but the growth, where did that come from? God. It's a beautiful metaphor. Verse 7. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. D do you notice here in verse 7, he, re he even removes reference to his name? and Apollos' name as an act of beautiful humility. He doesn't even mention himself by name. Look what he's doing here. He says, verse 7, for neither he who plants nor he who waters, he says, is anything. And, and it's not just an act of humility, and that's what it is. It's beautiful. But you know why he's doing that? Because he says, you know, by the way, insert name. Insert their name, and over the centuries, others' names, and your name, and my name. Because this assignment is not specific just to Paul and Apollos. It's for all of us who have come to faith in Jesus Christ. Look what he says here. Neither he who plants, neither who water, or he, excuse me, waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Do you see the difference now in this verse compared to the previous verse? The previous verse, God gave the growth, and then now this verse, God gives the growth. Gave, gives. Gave, past tense, past tense gives. Present tense and future tense. God gave the growth. God gives the growth. It continues. They were infants in Christ. They came to faith in Christ, and the growth continues. It doesn't stop there. Grace is not finished. Grace will lead you home. God continues to give them and you and me this growth, this grace. Gave, gives. Verse 8, he continues on with this metaphor. He who plants, Paul, he who waters, Apollos, are one, the same. No distinction. And each will receive his wages according to his labor. What is he talking about wages? Is he talking about monetary benefits? No, not necessarily. Sometimes if God can entrust you with those worldly riches, he will do that. Sometimes he doesn't because he doesn't want you to hurt yourself or hurt someone else. I said last week, it's been the case with us all these years I've been walking with the Lord. It's like he, God will do this purposely. He will deplete my earthly account so that he can fill up my spiritual account. It hurts. But the price of, of revealing God's glory in my heart and in your heart, you know what that price is? It's called brokenness. That's just how God does it. The wages he's referring to, you know what he says? He alludes to this concept, this, this beautiful thing of wages in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. He, he refers to the wages concept this way in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. He says, what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming? He asked, asked the question rhetorically, and now he answers. You know what he says? It's you. It's you. You are our glory and joy. In other words, 
the wages that Paul re that is referring to here in 1 Corinthians, it's them. That they're growing. That they're growing in their sanctification, their love for God, their love for God's word, their, their love for people. That's my wages, he says. That's my reward. Is to see you grow in your love for God and God's word and for people. So that's, that's sufficient. And then he says in verse 9, we, Apollos himself, we're God. We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. He says, we are God. Apostrophe, yes, we are God's. In other words, he's saying, we belong to God. And we're fellow workers, Apollos and I. We, we're just fellow workers. We're servants. We're servants of the Most High God, not of, of the idols around, not of the nations that surround us, certainly not of, of, of the things that they once worshipped. We are servants of the Most High God. We're one and the same. That's what we are. And you, listen to this beautiful, it's incredible how Paul talks about it. He, he describes them as a field and a building. So he's moving the metaphor now from a field to a build. Look, look what he's doing. He's, he, first he talked about the flesh, and then he's now, the metaphor was a field. Now he's going to transition his next metaphor into a building, into a structure. He says, you're a field. A field is to produce fruit. Wait, that's what a field is. And you're a building, you're a structure. A structure, a building, a home, a place of refuge. A place it's, that it's secure, where you can run to. The Lord is my refuge and ever-present help in times of trouble. Paul has that in mind here. And look what he does. And here it is. Verse 10 and 11. This is the crescendo, folks. I don't know if there's any symphony fans in the room. Have you ever been to the symphony? And you know the big kettle drums? And the goes go, 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 go. And all of a sudden, boom, the cymbals hit. And you know, man, this is, this is it. This is the, this is the apex that crescendo, that boom clashing of the cymbals, the apex is this verse right here. Look what he says, the most important verse in this chapter. He says, according to the law of God. Huh? I'm just checking to see if anybody's awake. Is that what he says? Look what he says. Grace. According to the grace of God. According to the grace of God given to me. He didn't earn it. According to the grace of God given to me. Like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. Someone else is building upon it. How do we even attempt to describe grace? Oh, it's been tried. Many men and women better than me have tried over the century. How do you describe it? How, do you, how, can, you, how can you even come to terms with this incredible grace? You, you know, grace and mercy... They do overlap. There are similarities, but there is a difference. Let's start with mercy. Mercy, what is mercy? Mercy is not receiving what I deserve. God in his mercy, ha mercy has withheld his wrath from me. I deserve that. But as an act of mercy, God has said, no, I am withholding that on this side. And on this side, we have grace. Grace is receiving what I do not deserve. God's unmerited favor and love. I didn't earn it. I can't. In fact, my very nature is to, is to discard it, to run from it. But one of the things we talked about this yesterday, Kevin and Mike and Larry and Carol and I, one of the things about grace, it is truly irresistible. And when grace anoints your will, then and only then are you free to choose. And you will always choose grace. So how do you describe it? Well, here's some of the characteristics, just thinking about this as, 
I was preparing for this this week. Grace, grace does not accumulate for itself. You know what grace does? It accommodates. Grace does not belittle or berate. Grace beckons. Grace does not dominate or is domineering. It deliberates. Grace is not seditious in that it destroys, but grace does tear down so that it can build you up. Grace is a mystery that is to be magnified because grace calms the storms, settles the strife, sets the pace and stays the course and grace seals the deal. Hallelujah. Praise God. Charles Spurgeon, one of my heroes, he said this, quote, listen to this, grace puts its hand on the lips of the boasting mouth and shuts it once and for all. I love that quote. And grace will call you home. Paul says, according to this grace, it was given to me. Remember what he says of himself in 1 Timothy? Oh, wretched man that I am, chief among sinners. It was his description of himself how grace transformed his life. Like a skilled master builder, if you're skilled at something, skilled master, it means you're ex, you have an ex, ex, uh, exceptional degree of skill. But we know this, that Paul was indeed a tent maker. Yes, indeed. But the skill that he's talking about here, you know what that comes from? Trial and error, failure, experience, over and over and over again. Basically, what he's saying to them and us, he says, you know, learn from my mistakes. Let me show you the way. Like a skilled master builder, he said, I laid a foundation. Someone else is building upon it. And look at verse 11. No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is, do you see it? Jesus Christ. I think I'm getting it now. I think I'm getting it now. The foundation that Paul's speaking of, this foundation, it's grace. Oh, but wait. This foundation of grace is Jesus Christ. Jesus is grace. Jesus is the foundation. They're one and the same. And here's the point. The point that Paul's making to, the, to them and to us. Grace is not a place. Grace is not even a thought or an ideology a philosophy, grace, is a person. Jesus Christ. The foundation. Build on the foundation of Jesus, of grace, with what? With more grace. The Apostle John says it this way. In John chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, he says... And from his fullness, he's referring to Jesus, and from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Upon grace, upon grace, upon grace. We have all received grace upon grace. He says, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That's what I love about God's word and how consistent and beautiful it is. Someone else is building upon it. No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 12. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, stones, wood, hay, straw. I don't know about you, but every time I read that, and I've read that passage a number of times, that, that, that verse right there just seems a little odd. It seems like an incomplete thought. Like, Paul, well, okay, gold, silver, where did that come from? Wood, hay, straw, and then he, like, it's like he moves on. No, he's not. Remember, he's still in this metaphor of a structure, of a building, okay? And he's still in this process of trying to describe the enormity of this grace of Jesus Christ. How do I describe this? You can picture Paul thinking to himself, what structure, what building in any way can capture the magnitude of grace? Well, would it be the synagogue? No. No, although that's a, a place of prominence. No, no. Herod's Praetorium, almost certainly not. That's a place of evil. Although the building itself is pretty magnificent. No, I know, I know, I got it. 
I got it, he says. Eureka, you know what it is? It's the temple. That's it. The magnificent temple, that, that's the biggest structure that he can think of. That's what he's, that's, that's a description of the magnitude of grace. And so what do we know about the temple? It took 46 years to build. The Bible tells us that. You know what else the Bible tells us about the temple? It was overlaid with gold, silver, and precious stones. It was, one of the ancient, it was one of the wonders of the ancient world. In fact, in fact, the history will tell us, the Bible will tell us that at the, at the apex of the sunlight, at the, at the apex of the day, when the sun was at its highest, the rays of the sun would hit the temple overlaid with gold, silver, and precious stones, and it would glimmer, and it would shine, and you would see it for miles and miles and miles. That's what grace is like. That's what it's like. You can almost picture Paul saying, yeah, that's it. Remember, he was very fond of using analogies, wasn't he? An analogy of a soldier in his full armor, an analogy of a, of a, of a farmer. He, was, he would use those, those everyday analogies to highlight an eternal port, point. That's what he's doing here. Because he makes the comparison of gold, silver, and precious stones. By the way, those things increase in value over time. They do not diminish in value. They increase in value over time. In comparison to what? Wood, hay, straw. He's making the distinction between grace and works. Wood, hay, straw, they have a purpose. They have a need. Good for a time. But once they've been used, they're to be discarded. In fact, they, those, the wood, hay, straw, you know what happens over time? They diminish in value. Diminish in value in comparison to the gold, silver, and precious stone that increases in value. Do you, do you see it? Do you see the metaphor? Do you see Paul? You can almost picture him struggling. How do I even describe the magnitude of this incredible grace? Anyone work? Well, you look at verse 13. He says, each one's work, the things you do as a result of this grace, will become manifest, known, revealed. He says, for the day, now look at this word in your Bible, day is capital D. It's not day and night like every day and night. It's a capital D. He's referring to one specific day. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one will do. What day is he talking about? He's talking about that day. Hebrews 9, 27 says, it is appointed for man to die once and then comes the judgment. But here he's talking about the Bema seat, right? We're familiar with the Bema seat? The day, the, the, the day will come when you, you and I will be in the very presence of Jesus Christ, who, by the way, is the foundation, who is grace. We will look Jesus in the eye. The Bible says that we will give an account for every idle word. I don't know about you, but that could be a long day for me. But at the end of that, he will say to me, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of your eternal rest. That's what grace does. I love Jesus so much. Man, I love him. Enter now. That day will disclose, Paul says. Reveal it. He says, revealed by fire. Fire is a metaphor. This is not a consuming fire. This is a cleansing fire. Where the wood, hay, and straw, in the, in the case of the fire, <laughs> gone. Gold, silver, precious stones. You know what the fire does to those minerals, those precious minerals? does away with the impurities and the dross, skims it. So what's left over is perfect. You see the metaphor? You see what he's trying to say? This is the, you can almost picture him trying to grasp the magnitude of the grace of Jesus Christ. And then he's, as he's concluding, he says, verse 14, he says, if the work that anyone has built 
on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. James, in chapter 1, verse 12, says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. You remember the Apostle Paul tells us that there are good works prepared beforehand? We are to do those. Don't know what they are necessarily, but I know. I know the one to whom I love. And there will be a reward. Yes. For you and for me in heaven. Don't forsake that. Don't be satisfied with, with wood, hay, and straw. Don't be satisfied with milk. Go for the deeper, deeper things of the Lord. Ask God to transform you, continue to transform you by His amazing grace. Verse 15, if anyone, anyone's work is burned up, gone, he will suffer loss. He will lose some of those rewards. He says, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. The builder will be saved like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames, if you can picture that. But everything else will be burnt up. That's so important. The grace of Jesus Christ is. Jesus is our cornerstone. Remember, he is our model. Making disciples of Jesus is our mission. The love of God, the love of God's word, the love of people, that is our motive. The Holy Spirit is our means. And the grace of Jesus Christ, the gospel of all grace, is our message. It hasn't changed. It'll never change. It will always be that. As I conclude, I want to share with you one of the most incredible passages in God's Word, a passage that Larry and I were talking about this yesterday, similar passage that I believe, Larry, is the same passage that you came to faith in Christ, is Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Jesus, Jesus says this. Now listen to this. Come to me. Come to me. Who? Who is he talking about? All. Who what? Who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Anybody in this room ready for some rest? Maybe it's just me. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Attach yourself to me and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Those eternal words changed my life all those years ago and continue to do so to this day. Don't take grace for granted. Don't. Don't take Jesus for granted. Don't take the gospel of grace for granted. Fall in love with it again. Be transformed from the inside out. Be people that'll be known. Those people, those people over there, they, they go to Pineland Baptist Church. They're filled with grace. They love the Lord. And they love me. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Join me as we close in a word of prayer. Father, I never tire of speaking about your amazing grace. It has, it is, and it will transform me. Father, you know, and I repent and confess that so many times I discard that, so many times I forget, so many times I take for granted, yes, this amazing grace, but now somehow, some way, I convince myself that I have to earn it. Grace has put an end to earning once and for all, but has not put an end to effort. In fact, grace enhances effort. Because now I do the things, no longer because I have to, but now because I want to. As an expression of my love for you. So Lord, help us to come to terms with that, maybe fresh and anew this morning as we go from here, as we think upon these things, Lord, just that you would remind us Renew our passion for the grace of Jesus Christ. We do love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.